I'm making this recording on the 22nd of September 2020. And as you can see, the sunshine is absolutely glorious. So we may be on some sort of COVID lockdown, uh, but at least I'm able to sit in the garden and make this video for you. So what we're going to look at in this video is focusing on this whole theme of the flipped classroom and especially using something like Adobe Spark as a resource to enable you so that you can take your classroom teaching and be able to put this into um, a really good e-learning format. So however good you think you are in the classroom or the lecture hall, Think of being equally, if not better, um, in an e-learning presence. Because the trouble is in the past that so many people have just used their virtual learning environments as a dumping ground for uh, various learning resources, PDFs, uh, PowerPoints, Prezi's, that type of thing. They've just used them in a passive form of learning. So the whole notion of flipped classroom encourages us to think of this totally differently. And that's what we're going to do in this video. So one of the key things that we need to do in relation to flipped classroom technique is to look at having a dynamic presence, not just um, a repository or a passive presence at all. We need a dynamic here and now presence for our, for our students, our learners. And especially using resources like Adobe Spark, we'll be able to integrate that, and I'll give you examples on how to, integrate that through teaching, learning and effective assessments as well. For the newly qualified teachers, presumably you've spent some time studying the philosophies of teaching and learning, and therefore you're up to date with all of this. But for many of us who did our uh, teacher training some time ago, we might need an updating, especially from the point of view of the often used term pedagogy. All of our institutions routinely use this term all the time. But of course, pedagogy has got a certain uh, dimension to it, especially from the point of view of expert, knowledgeable knower imparting this knowledge to those who are less so. Now, that's totally different for those of us working with adult learners, especially those of us in healthcare practice, for example, who work with people who are already qualified as healthcare professionals, and now they're coming back for more adult learning, andragogical learning, CPD. So this video is meant to give you the opportunity to look at shifting yourself from expert uh, pedagogical provider to equally expert andragogical facilitator. So this might be a good opportunity to revisit some of those early uh, learning philosophies that we would have all studied as part of our initial teacher training. So pedagogical learning, as you'll see in one of the other videos on this Adobe Spark, is very much hand feeding our students. It's we as the experts giving them the knowledge that they're currently lacking. Whereas a shift to andragogical learning is very, very different here. Um, it's looking at our learners as experienced knowers and seeing how they can translate this and relate their knowing to new um, information that we're now imparting to them. For those of you who know me, uh, you already know that I love Miss Jean Brodie, uh, the f uh, fictitious character uh, created by Muriel Sparks in uh, the prime of Miss Jean Brodie. And one of the classic sayings that she comes out with, which is so andragogical, even though she's using it with little people, with children, uh, is to say that the word education comes from the, it, it's a Greek root, eh as in exodus, to leave something, to move out of something, and ducere is to lead. So it's to lead out of individuals, learning that they already know. And especially when we're working with adult learners, it's to be able to appreciate and to recognise what they know already and to put that in relation to the new learning that we're now providing to them. But when it comes to this whole notion of flipped classroom technique, it's not just us as teachers that need to relearn our whole approach to teaching and learning, 
but our students as well. Because if they've only been accessing their virtual learning environment, Moodle, for example, if they've only been accessing that as passive learners, maybe to get their handbooks or to drop off their assignments or to get various learning materials, then they too have fallen into this trap of passive learning. So the challenge for us um, in relation to flipped classroom technique is to bring our learners along with us, so us and them, as we relearn new ways of pre uh, presenting our materials and new ways to encourage them to engage with it as well. So it's taking them from passive reader to active learner. And here's one example I'd like to share with you, something that I've produced as a learning resource using Adobe Spark as a, um, a flipped classroom technique uh, presentation. So this would have been a two hour classroom session I would have done with the learners. So some parts of it would have been lecture delivery, other parts of it may, it may have been group work for them to get involved with, or individual or small couple work together. Lots of different things that would have happened in a two hour period, and now I'm having having to transpose that into an e-learning environment. So what I've done is to take my PowerPoint, deliver it in various ways across Adobe Spark, and I'll show you how to do that later, and also keep back some of it so that when we do meet online, at least I've got some materials to build on then to work as a, a specific seminar or workshop presentations. So, when it comes to using Adobe Spark, I've already created quite a few resources for this, and you'll be able to click the buttons throughout this current Adobe Spark page and access those if you're not sure how to use it at all. But when it comes to using Adobe Spark, it's not just that, but there's another program as well called Adobe Rush, which is fantastic for being able to edit down videos. In fact, this video has taken me so long to make because the sun's moving, the aeroplanes are coming across, there's noises, so I'll use Adobe Rush to be able to edit this. When it comes to Adobe Spark, there are three critical elements of it that you can be using. The first one is called Adobe Spark Page. And with Adobe Page, that's where you're creating individual internet pages. So if you've got a PowerPoint or Prezi that you would have been using for your classroom session, create a brand new Adobe Page. And that's customizing it for the specific learners that you've got for whichever course it is. So you're creating something that takes the place of of your two-hour classroom session or however long that session would have been and that's the Adobe Spark page. Another element of Adobe Spark is something called Adobe Post, uh, Spark Post or sometimes it's called Spark Graphic. Whichever program you're using it might have slightly different names and what that means is you can take one of your own photographs or you've got access to thousands of free photos. Uh, so if you type in a theme for example you'll find loads and loads of photos on this and what you can do with those then is to download the photograph into an Adobe Spark uh, post and then put your text across it so whether you're trying to create posters for conferences or um, individual images there's so much you can do with the Adobe Spark um, uh, graphic. And the final element of Adobe Spark is to be able to use Adobe Spark videos. Now you'll see one at least in the Spark page that I'm presenting for you here. And uh, here are a few others that I've already prepared. But when you're actually in the program and you're looking at it, it's very much a PowerPoint. It's so easy to use. So what you actually do is you do a voiceover or you can use little video clips, but you can do a voiceover. So it may be that you're taking your PowerPoint set, you want to put um, certain slides or text from those slides on each of the individual slides in Adobe Spark video and then you can speak your voice over this. So it might be a case of you taking elements of your um, presentation that you would have done in the classroom, just put some key words on each of the individual slides, but then you've got up to 30 seconds per slide to do a voice over for your students. And I'm only going to briefly mention Adobe Rush because I'll, I'll have other resources for you to be able to click on to see those. But if you just Google uh, on YouTube, look out the name for Rob Nelson, you'll find some perfect examples of how to edit in Adobe Rush. So Adobe Rush is really good for using 
um, videos and being able to edit them really, really easily. So if you're on your mobile phone, you might be traveling somewhere and maybe there's a message you want to post to your students or there's maybe images. So keep on collecting loads of video images all the time. And then when you get into Adobe Rush, you can edit them. You can put um, voiceover to them, uh, sound tracking, um, title pages. There's so much that you can do by using Adobe Rush. And that, again, creates your presence with your students in a way that the Adobe Spark video may be more of a voiceover. So you can use videos in Adobe Rush. And when I mentioned right at the beginning about Adobe Spark being really good for teaching, learning and assessing, then yes, I'd like to give you an example here. For one of my modules called Promoting Sexual Health, in 2020, for the first time, I incorporated Adobe Rush as their, their summative assignment for this course. So in, in the past, they would have created um, a, a sexual health promotion leaflet and then written an academic essay to go with this. Now in the current mode, I've actually turned it into an Adobe Spark resource and for level seven, they also have to make some videos and edit those in Adobe Rush as well. So here from this one particular student is a perfect example of an assignment done using Adobe Spark incorporating Adobe Rush. And finally, on to some recommendations. And I need to make these quickly because the sun's passing so quickly. Um, I bet you the shadows are going all over me and I can't even see. The important thing here is to look at how we can use or transform our virtual learning environments into an active community of learning for our students. Here are some practical tips on what to do. First of all, take your PowerPoint or Prezi or what you would have normally delivered in your classroom session and now you need to break it up in relation to uh, the flip classroom technique. But this is where we need to go back to our pedagogy, our andragogy, pedandragogies. We need to go back and think, if I was presenting this in the classroom, I might be standing there to do some lecture presentation for some of it. Then I'd stop and get them to do some group work or I might give some handouts for them to work on. All the different elements of it, that's what you now need to take and to transform for the flip classroom technique. E-learning is not a case of just going to the shelf and picking off something ready-made. Um, it means that you've got to take time and effort, uh, make time and effort to create this. So it could be that you're taking your, your usual presentation, maybe you've been developing these and obviously updating them. Uh, you've been developing these for a number of years now, but because of the current situation, we're having to redevelop these and to present them in a totally different format. So we have to stop and think, how is the best way that we can now develop these for our learners of today? Of course, we're all concerned about the NSS results. And when you consider that in these days of COVID-19, some of the students are finding it difficult to shift from classroom-based teaching to e-learning, then um, they'll rate us unfavorably on the NSS. So it is really important that we create the best that we can do, given the resources that we have, to make this e-learning live for them and be really meaningful. So my suggestion here is to take your, uh, your presentation, whether it's in PowerPoint or Prezi, and split it into the three different formats of Adobe Spark. So base it in the Adobe Spark page, use some Adobe Spark videos, but also consider making customized little images um, in Adobe Spark post. And that's going to show that you really are thinking about this and presenting it for the students in a way that's relevant to each and every 
individual session that you're creating. Also, it's really important with e-learning to make it um, creative and to give opportunities for feedback and feed forward. If you look at some CPD articles in various professional journals, you will see that they often have points where they encourage the readers to stop and think about what they've learned. Uh, to reflect on it, to look at it in different ways, but then it's important for the teacher, for you as the individual, to be able to give them feedback on that. It's no good asking a whole load of questions about well, what do you think of this sort of thing, and then they're left high and dry, not knowing whether their answers are right or wrong, or could they have considered them differently. So it's really important for you to give feedback so that they know how well they're doing and also feed forward in relation to what they should be thinking of to take them to the next stage. When it comes to the terms uh, implementation, the, the corollary to this is supplementation. So maybe when you're walking around, use your mobile device to take videos of different things. So you can start putting in little images of various backgrounds or things to make your videos far more interesting. Also, it's really important to make your sessions as interactive as possible. Don't just give them a two hour lecture. Um, I once saw somebody using Panopto to record a session and the individual actually had um, a laptop in front of them where the camera was looking up their nostrils and the person sat there and read notes for the whole of this lecture presentation. That's not going to work as a good effective e-learning resource. You can see how long this video has taken me to uh, prepare. Not only is the sun completely moved now behind some trees, but there are noises in the background and everything. OK, but I thought it was important to sit outside in the garden on such a beautiful day and make this video for you. OK, so when it comes to looking at student engagement, it's really important to consider um, CPD articles. Have a look at those, especially within your, within your own field of professional practice. See the way in which they're delivered, where some elements of it are information giving, but then there are opportunities for the students to stop and consider certain things. So it may be that you're making recommendations for them to look elsewhere, to build on other knowledge, to give feedback from their experience, whole loads of things. But it's very important for you to be able to give feedback um, at the same time. And here's a little image that I'll also put on the Adobe Spark page. Some top tips for your e-learning. And I think I'm probably breaking those already with the sun going out of the way now, uh, changing image in the background. But it really is important, first of all, to make sure you've got a clean lens. Uh, the number of people who are accessing, whether it's Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams, and Automatically, you can tell that the lens is rather dirty. It's clouded, um, not very clear looking. So make sure you've got a really good clean lens. Set your camera at an appropriate level as well, because if your camera is ready built into your laptop and if you're staring down at your, um, uh, your camera, then it may be that it's looking right up your nostril. Not the nicest situation to be able to look at uh, throughout a lecture. So make sure your camera is in a particularly good position. And if your camera is low down on your laptop, maybe put your laptop up on a stack of books so at least you've got it going in at eye level. And that's really important as well to be able to face your audience, especially for our healthcare professionals. They're saying that they're doing more and more online consultations now. And it is difficult talking to a static little box with a, um, a glass lens in front of it, but we've got to get more and more used to this. So at least it looks as if we are addressing our specific audience rather than looking away in totally distracted ways. Okay, so face your audience as well. And that involves speaking clearly to your audience. And finally, to be able to develop your online persona. So you may be fantastic in the classroom and maybe you're very, very animated. You might walk around and everything. Here I am sitting here. Uh, I haven't moved from this seat as I'm making this presentation. If I was in a classroom, I'd probably be up and down across the main stage and up and down the aisles as well. So how can we take our own persona and make it our own in this new online learning environment. Also, when it comes to your virtual learning environment, um, at the University of Greenwich, we use uh, Moodle, but there are others as well. So whichever, whichever online learning environment you're using, 
don't just stick to the basics, especially each year when you open up your new VLE for a specific module, it may be literally the core basics that are there. Look at all the options you've got to be able to develop this as best as possible. So especially if you're used to using just one or two little apps on there, set yourself a goal that this year or this term, you're going to find out how to use some more as well, so that you're starting to learn and develop um, your virtual learning environment. Another important addition is to use alternative applications, apps such as Flipgrid or Wikilet. Uh, look at ways of using new apps within your VLE so that you're not just constrained to the amount that you have available through your institution, but you can develop additional resources along with the basics. And finally, when it comes to others, start asking your colleagues what they use as well. And maybe good opportunities for sharing this learning would be um, if you've got faculty away days or school away days, you've got specific opportunities to be able to share this with others. So even if you do start using a brand new resource within your VLE, it may be new to you, chances are it's going to be new to others as well. So use that, share it with others and inspire others in what you're doing. Doing. And also, once you do start developing lots of new resources, maybe you want to start offering these right across your institution. At the University of Greenwich, we have something called Greenwich Learning and Teaching, uh, GLT. So I'm already teaching Adobe Spark sessions and Adobe Rush. So, um, and then that's another good example of something that you can do to develop your own learning on this. If you sign up for the free courses on Adobe Education Exchange, um, Adobe edX, sign up for those, do as many as you want to. They have little courses, maybe just taking a couple of hours or so, right through to 15, 20, 25 hours over the next few weeks. So you can sign up for so many of these little courses and then feed that back to others. So don't just use it to improve your own VM but share that with your colleagues as well because I bet you that quite a few are struggling especially in these days of COVID when they're trying to move from their classroom presence to their online learning presence. And finally, taking all of this to be able to flip it all, to flip your classroom presence. And one of the things I've started doing now is to creating Adobe Spark pages for each of the classroom sessions I would normally be providing. Give these to the teachers to put on the VLE and put them on at least a week beforehand. Ask the students to work through them. So all the lecture stuff I would do as little videos and all these other little things that I'm showing you on this Adobe Spark resource. So do this as a resource for the students, expect them to work through it, but keep back some of the um, some of the questions you would have used in group work and then you can use those as a workshop uh, when you are with them online. So it might be a case that you show them um, an example of some of the questions you do expect them to consider and that you will discuss further when you meet them online. So it might be that you give them some of your PowerPoint slides saying, look, this is what we would have done in classroom. These are the, uh, the workshop elements of this. Please consider this, take some notes and be prepared to share those with us when we meet in our online session. And that way, the flip classroom technique is you're giving your information preload that's happening first of all, and then when you have the students online, that's when you've got the opportunity to have this more as a seminar or as a workshop. But obviously when we're talking of the flipped classroom technique, that's where there's that barrier or that difficulty again. If the students haven't been used to this, then they may even need prompting to sign online first of all, um, and to get used to working in this new way of thinking. And that's it for this session. As you can see, there was a lot of sunshine at the beginning. It's now hiding behind the trees. There's lots of background noises, uh, but I hope this session has been okay for you. Thank you so much for listening.